All right, let's. All right. Um, so, hey, thanks for hopping in the Code Review Weekly Workshop where we talk about uh, code review. Um, if there's some things you want to show and tell that have been interesting that you've been using while you're reviewing code or things that you think about or look at, or if you have any questions pertaining to code review, this is a great place for us to synchronously talk about it, publish the recording, and we can continue the conversation asynchronously as well. Uh, but then we also have a really fun time where we get to pair on a code review. If anyone has a code review in their, um, in their doc that we could all hop on uh, and, and pair, similar to how we do with the front end pairing and back end pairing. I've got the first item here uh, where I've been using uh, running tests locally with coverage. Uh, this has never worked for me in the main GitLab projects because I didn't know about uh, this option where I can say collect coverage from. If I just ran yarn run just coverage foo spec, it would try to collect coverage from all the files and show that we're not covering anything because you're just running one test. But it actually works if you specify collect coverage from. So what it would look like, uh, let me open up the code. Uh, I was reviewing an MR over here. Um, but what it would look like is, so here's the, I'll close these other tabs. Uh, would love to know if there's something similar. Um, uh, to this in Ruby land. Uh, but I would run coverage. That's not how you spell coverage. Select coverage from, is that what it said? Yeah. And so then I'm going to paste in the um, subject under test, and then I'll pass in my uh, main test here. Hopefully this all works. All right, cool. So I think there were some assertions that failed because I was poking around at this, but you can see, okay, we got you know pretty decent coverage. I haven't been able to on pre on other projects. I've been able to get it to spit out this really cool table where it actually shows me the lines that are uncovered, and I think you can actually jump into that specifically here. Uh, you can, um, oh, geez, Louise, where is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it actually like spits out this report. I've been able to get it to where it spits it out on the terminal, but for some reason I can't figure out how that's, why that's not working in the GitLab project. Um, but you can actually open up these index files and see the actual lines that are uncovered. Um, which is interesting. It's definitely interesting for, I think when we introduce new files, I like using this, just knowing like, okay, do we, do we have, have we established a pretty good test harness for this new file. It's a lot easier for me to understand that question uh, than just parsing through the all the unit tests, which you know oftentimes our unit tests end up a little bigger than our main subject under test. So uh, I just been finding that helpful. Not only use it all the time, but in certain situations running the coverage locally just for that one unit test has been helpful for me. Uh, yeah. Do do you all Backenders know if there's a Ruby equivalent to doing this? Oh, there is. Um, I have to look at the docs. Uh, That's all right. Somehow. Just knowing there is, that it's in the documentation. Yeah, there's some way. Cool. Yeah. Just knowing that it exists uh, will encourage me to look for it. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I rely upon the little colors in the MR uh, diff, but those aren't always there. Yeah, and I, I think the coverage report is not always finished. That's why that's why I do it because I don't know when yeah. and when that's not working and yeah, yeah, and you don't want to wait for the pipelines to finish. Yeah, um, so, but they definitely way because when you have an issue with the coverage report, like you want to be able to test that locally to see if you fixed it. So there's some something somewhere in the developer guidelines about how to get it to run. Okay, yeah, I'll have, to, I'll have to check that out. Um, this was really helpful for me when I was writing code. Um, on the new web ID, we had to implement a file system interface. Interface had like 30 plus methods. It's like really low-ish level that you'd imagine from a file system interface. It's like nodes, file system thing. 
And I could have, um, I could have tested this by each function, all of the inputs, like, did we do all the stuff that way? But there are specific use cases we're really interested in. So I was able to run the coverage report and get it to tell me what lines were uncovered and come up with use cases that I could add like more almost integration level testing at the top that were actually like more helpful than these, like, did I write the function I expected it to write? So that's my favorite way of using it too, is coming up with use, coming up with use case tests that cover more of the behavior of the specific lines you're missing. But obviously hundred percent coverage is also like, that's a myth and like, so you gotta, you gotta, you can't get, tunnel visioned on it, but it's uh, a, a helpful thing to keep an eye on. Cool. Thanks for letting me share that. Um, one small thing that's just crossing my mind while you um, while you showed those things. This would be a perfect request widget for our pro uh, product, wouldn't it? Like we do have test coverage by highlighting it and the different stuff. But um, when it comes to the to the MR, I guess it would be great for any kind of diff being like, hey, test coverage dropped, increased, or whatever it might have been. Yes, I think so too. I just don't, for some reason, it's there. I feel like I've seen it, and then it's it's disappeared. I thought we had it too, or like... I know. Not, maybe I'm not, like, I feel like we had something that was about coverage. Let me let me just paste it in the agenda. I just looked in our docs, and that's what I found. Just put it in there. Um, but from what I get, it's only in our diffs. Not it's so only in MR the, diffs. Yeah, not so much in the MR overview. This would actually be sorry. No, sorry. Um, I was going to say that I bet if I was, um, I, I, I'm not a very, I'm not a very wise developer of my time. Uh, I get nerd sniped easily of like, oh man, I can run the coverage. You know, I get tunnel visioned and nerd sniped easily. Uh, uh, I think one way that we could do it is we have a coverage job. Or these just, oh, I don't know if these, oh no, we probably do it per just job. Either way, those static assets will have the like, probably have those HTML reports that we could actually open from the job, the job artifacts. So that's, I think one option for our project is those HTML files that have all the summary might actually be job artifacts that we could look into as well. On one of the jobs, I would imagine, but yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Yannick. Yep, uh, very last uh, thing on this, that this should actually be within my team or at least not very close. So in the next Outlook meeting, I'll just ask uh, people who know our product better than us and we'll see where I take it. Oh, yeah. Sweet. Um, I put the, the next point on the agenda. It's a little trivial, but I was amazed how, how much benefit there was in for me this week that's why i'm sharing it's slightly related to mrs uh it is very related to mrs not so much about we'll, we'll see about reviews so um what i've been working on this week have been a couple of small changes that were all very much related to each other but still different enough to justify different mrs because they'll be going through ux reviews and all this this kind of process you I had several reasons I didn't want to end up with a with a massive MR. Um, but to make my life easier, I actually built this this MR chain basically, starting out with the the very first MR and then branching out of it and setting um setting my first created MR as the source branch, where I was at the beginning a little bit concerned where this might bring me, but it worked out perfectly fine. You just have to time the reviews to getting in a little bit to not confuse people but um, for several things I might stick with this technique because there's uh, there's so much things you'll be actually solving without rebasing not not running into any conflicts just for developer experience I really really enjoyed this so I was wondering um anybody of you doing a similar thing do you have any workflows in place or is this something you not really do any day to day 
are you talking about having like a part one, part two, part three MR, and these are part three is based off of part two's branch and part two is based off of part one's branch? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I love that. I, I do that all the time. Um, how I, do you deal with it? How do you deal with the maintainer reviews on the final MR? It means that the final MR will be probably huge and you still need the same person that reviewed the previous one. So they have a context or. Um, I went the other way around, basically having my first iteration, which was a small change reviewed and maintained and merged. Um, and while this was still, that, that was the very first thing. Um, so how do I put this? It actually allowed me to keep on working while the reviews were still in place, but um, it was not that I merged all these branches together and put it in one review. It was rather splitting up my work and then actually have it reviewed four times, you would say. But yeah, just split in chunks. So that's how I dealt with it. Yeah, I guess I would, I've been doing something similar. But I try to get um, the ones that I've been doing are where I can like merge the smaller pieces in first and then base the later work off the smaller pieces. Uh, what I keep running into, and it's not, it's just a little bit of an annoyance, is I have to do like rebase onto as the, the top MR merge into master because of the squash. So often like you'll get a review and feedback. So you make some changes and then that gets squashed and the commit hash changes, which makes all of the later MRs now look like they're changing more files than they actually are. And I find that to be, I don't know, as a reviewer, I would be very confused. <laughs> so I often will go and take what's now the top MR and do rebase onto like go to master find the new commit hash and then kind of just like redo everything. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't know if there's a better way. Um, do you, have you ever, I, yeah. Have you ever considered like using fix up commits instead of squat? Uh, I got feedback from someone when I first started working here to like, not do that. Oh, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. <laughs> they for said it made it really hard for them to review the MRs. And, yeah. So I, <laughs> feedback from like a maintainer that they didn't like it and so i stopped okay. using it well that may that prevent that... if you yeah so unfortunately like gitlab's ui does not support fix up commits as well as it should um but if you only have one commit uh you just want to make sure you check that hey we're going to squash before merge and then yeah, every, I got, but every uh, time you push, it'll change it to draft. So that's the other weird thing is you need to make sure to every time I push a new fix up commit, I have to undraft my MR. Um, but I use it all the time because mm -hmm. it helps reviewers to know, OK, based on this last round of changes, this is this is the latest commit of the changes, the immediate changes. And if I had more branches pointing to that, I don't have to do the I don't have to do all of the rebasing stuff because the Shahs haven't changed. Um, most it, to me, it's just another way of re renaming. People use eff effectively fix up commits by titling a commit code review feedback. Uh, yeah, that's effectively you should just call it fix up. Um, I think the issue is we just don't want to merge fix up commits, and so when we do squash before merge, which most maintainers are pretty mindful of 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 what is the commit history of actually going to be merged? Uh, it should be fine. Um, but I'll I, I'll find myself doing these like multi-part MRs and not having to rebase as often because I'll do it incremental fix-up commits when I get feedback. If I do like a big breaking change, then yeah, I'll have to, then I'll do a squash and whatever else I need to do. But um, one of the things I'm mindful of is on round two, three plus of the MR, the reviewer has one set of changes that they that are fresh for them to look at. So they don't have to look up the whole change set again. Yeah. That I definitely yeah, I definitely feel that. I'm that's so, to that's so interesting you got feedback not to do that. Because we actually correct me if I'm wrong to tell you, I remember Mark telling the front enders really try to do this. Yep, we had it. Okay. 
It must be a bad. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see people use them a ton in the back end there's a few yeah. here and there but i feel like most folks when i'm reviewing things uh they will just leave a little commit message that says like review comments fixes from the maintain a review or something i wonder how um, many like comp but yeah i mean i'll give it a whirl if i get the feedback again i mean i feel like to me that seems a little bit like personal preference but when i was first working here i'm like well <laughs> i don't know like if it's if it's making it hard for the person to review like i'll be happy to change it but i don't know does the fix up mean that someone can't review it right no i mean that's that should just be nothing but helpful right because they could click on i'll i'll reply i'll say what what i'll say is hey back to you i made the latest changes in the latest fix up commit and so they're able to go to the commits and see just the latest changes we're going to fix up. If I had to do a rebase or whatever else we had to do, like that's, I find that helpful. Um, but I don't know. Um, that is interesting feedback. Yeah. Danger use, I imagine Danger was probably complaining at some point because it wasn't always able to detect if you were going to squash or not. Um, so that might have been relevant. But no, it's a good idea to try again. Um, I feel like I have my feet under me a little bit more. So maybe I can give it a whirl. <laughs> How, like you forget, I joined in like March 2020. That summer was a really, you just like the whole year is just not, sure. it was a wild time. So uh, I think at, at GitLab, how efficient we are and how much, you know, things get done. It's like, it's like a month or two. And then you're like, oh, okay, you're part of the furniture now you're yeah you, you definitely get to make your own rules if you want to use fix up commits go for it terry <laughs> uh cool all right did anyone else have any other uh tips or questions they would like to share pertaining to code review How do um, people feel about? Oh yeah, what were you saying? Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. I wonder how do people feel like about uh like putting lots of stuff, putting lots of uh code into like which is one feature, um into one MR. Currently, I'm working on a. It's kind of a fix up rather than a feature. It's kind of like fixing something, fixing precision on one of the columns. Um, and so I have three migrations um, and I put all of them into one of my, and um, yeah, how do people feel about that? I kind of feel like it could have been split, but then the, this, this, the uh, kind of, I don't know. I feel better just putting them into one MR, making sure that they like go after each other. Although with the timestamp, that we wouldn't be a problem anyway. Um, but I just wonder how others would approach that. That's a good question. That's really related to what Yannick was talking about too. Uh, I feel like I have seen like related. Are you talking about database migrations? Like yeah, yeah. the related database migrations, I feel like if they're related, I I have seen them in the same MR. Mm -hmm. Um it's like you can have both sides of of what you're looking at. Where it's um if you're as a reviewer, I feel like having them in the same MR might help because you'll have context of what you're reviewing and you may not have the same reviewers and maintainers uh, on the same thing. Um but balance that with like a very, very large MR. <laughs> and I don't know. I, I have seen sometimes on database where I've asked folks, like, if there's any way for you to split this up, please do. No one ever does. But I always feel like I'll at least ask, because you please split this up if possible, because it's too big. Um, when they try to put like database changes in addition with 
backend changes using the database things and front end changes using the database things. Like, so for that, that's more problematic than having a multiple migration MR. Uh, but I, I am not a database maintainer. So <laughs> I'm a reviewer. And most of the time, I feel like I'm trying my best to review things, and the maintainers always find more stuff. So, um, but if you haven't gotten feedback from the maintainer to split it up, I feel like it's probably fine. Um, and another interesting thing, um, thanks, Terry, by the way. Um, another interesting thing is um, the recommended re reviewers. You know how like we get the table with a couple of names um, and, and depending on what kind of changes you make, you get the recommended reviewer. And so for this particular MR, which only has migrations, I, I got only like the database reviewer and database maintainer, no like backend reviewers or backend maintainers. Um, and I, I'm kind of going with that, but I, I kind of feel that I would I would be happy to ping someone else from my team, like just a backend engineer. Um, but I wonder how people feel about that. Like I would pink more people than it's recommended. It's completely fine to do so because we also have someone called domain expert, at least on the front end side we do. I think we do have on the back end side. And for your team, domain expert most likely are your team members. So it's absolutely fine to ping them, to ask for their review, to ask for early review. For example, we do this on the very, very early stages when it's not even ready. But to ping just a few people to take a look if it makes sense to go in this direction, for example. Maybe it's just like full stop and switch to something else. So don't be afraid to pin more people than Relet recommends. And if, for example, if you lack some reviewers, most likely the reviewer or maintainer will say so. So it's like, mm -hmm. uh, I would also recommend pinning someone from back end or in the front end case, like, I would recommend pinging someone from UX to take a UX review. So don't worry about this and don't, don't be afraid to ping people. Awesome. Thanks, Natalia. Yeah, I'm not sure how other teams work, but um, on the search team, we often, because our team deals with Elasticsearch and OpenSearch, and there's not a ton of folks with domain expertise in those areas, we will often pick uh, the initial reviewer just from our team. That way the maintainer can have more confidence that somebody with that domain expertise has taken a look at it and it kind of also covers like the back end review. That makes a lot of sense. That's like, a good example. What'd you say? What'd you say, Katya? Uh, I, I, a follow up question. So even though they were not recommended as like people to pick, you've like picked outside of that scope. Is that Sometimes I'll just ignore it and pick who I want. Yeah, that's <laughs> Sometimes a, we all do. I, 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 uh, never, I never interpreted DangerBot's, the inverse of DangerBot's recommendation as I don't recommend pinging these people. Like DangerBot recommends these people, does not recommend anyone else. That's one way to interpret it, but I don't think that's what it means. Uh, the one, yeah, the one thing I would, I would suggest um, if you have like, a backend domain expert and you want to get their opinion as well as wanting to get it maintainer reviewed. Um, it's for efficiency's sake, you really want to assign one person to review the back end or review the front end at a time. Otherwise, if two people are assigned to it, no one's probably going to pick it up or they'll start conflicting with each other, which can be uh, challenging. So it sounds like Terry has a story. I will say that is, yeah, that is, no, that is, I've had... <laughs> I've had database review because I'm only the initial re reviewer where they've assigned me and then like other database people who like clearly know more than I do. And so I'm kind of just like, what do you do in that case? The, you know, I, I go on this MR and there's like 68 discussions already where I, I felt, you know, I cannot contribute to this anymore. I, at that point, I think I said, I'm just going to unassign myself. It seems like you're getting like help and I don't feel like I can really like give anything else but I'm just gonna watch what happens <laughs> and you know maybe learn from this but yeah it is hard I, so I will plus one to just assigning the don't assign the same like two back-end reviewers at the same time or two of the same first type of reviewer 
it can be confusing. And and doing what you did, Terry, makes a lot of sense. And just politely excusing yourself if you're like, hey, my presence here is not efficient. So, yeah. I would add, you can assign two people, but you need to specify very clearly what do you expect from them. So sometimes I've been assigned to the MR that already had a reviewer and maintainer, but I've been a very specific type of the problem. So like, we are stuck with Apollo caching, for example. Could you please help us with this little part? So I'm not looking at the MR, I'm just looking at what I'm asked to do for, but so if you're assigning multiple people, give them tasks. Like, I expect you to do this. Yeah, that's a good idea. I actually heard it uh, either way, right? Like some people say, yeah, assign a few people because that will speed up the code review. And now oh, you just said like probably better not to because uh, they they don't know what they should do or like there is there might be a conflict. So it, I heard it both ways. <laughs> I wonder so if they mean like, I will assign multiple people for review, but I gate like I need an initial front end review. I need initial back end review. I need a QA review because for the efficiency, like I don't want to wait often. Yeah. The, oh, yeah. I'm not going to lie. Like I don't always look at the front end code. If there's front end code in an MR that I'm reviewing, I trust that the other MR reviewers have looked at it. I'll like glance at it if I need to, but I'm not going to go digging in view. Hopefully that's okay. I I look at the so back. like from that aspect I will assign like three people at once you know what I said I look at the back end code what are you saying I'm joking I know you do uh, no it's definitely it's, sometimes, me. Sometimes. it's hard it is hard. yeah no don't don't worry about it but yeah that's for efficiency sake of like hey you shouldn't be expected to be an expert in something that you're not claiming to be so don't be efficient about it is definitely uh the goal um yes and terry you're 100 correct we should assign reviewers um across the stack to parallel them is a great idea um and as maintainers and reviewers if an author hasn't done that like the bias for action if we see hey this mr needs looks this mr needs to go like let's not just let the uh, sometimes authors need you know some coaching from example of how to be really efficient with this as well. And as reviewers, we can do that by um, just taking a bias for action and pinging reviewers on an MR, which um, happens a lot in community contributions, but sometimes happens within MRs within our own team. Cool. This is a good, this is a good question. Um, I do think, uh, I do want to, go back to uh your question um uh, i know i keep saying your name wrong because i forgot the actual pronunciation of it but i keep saying cassia but i i remember hearing i remember knowing that that's not the right pronunciation is that that's not the right pronunciation almost oh uh it's kasha kasha like All right. <laughs> thank you i appreciate it um yeah uh you asked the question about one big mr and earlier, Yannick was talking about splitting up MRs and splitting up within parts. And I want to rant about something as a reviewer. This is my least favorite thing that I see happen is I usually see it this way. This is the story that plays out. Someone's somewhat, somewhat green to contributing to GitLab. Their MR is a little large. And they get feedback. Hey, your MR is a little large. So then they start like aggressively horizontally slicing the MR where it's not just here's the back end, then here's the front end. It's from the front end is like, here's the component I'm going to use in a future MR. And that component's not referenced anywhere. Uh, that I've always had a hard time reviewing because as a reviewer, it's so helpful when you're introducing new units or making changes to see how is this new thing going to be used and consumed. So, the more as reviewers, and, and this happens as well, of talked about like coaching efficiency by example, uh, 
oftentimes you may find ways to just coach, hey, here's a different way we could have sliced this up. It's fine now, but if we slice it vertically, that's my favorite way to slice things up. But let's integrate everything very simple way, but then we'll expand these and further parts that even allows like not just part one, part two, part three of Mars that are stacked on top of each other, but you can even have, after you have it all vertically integrated, you could then have multiple parts all pointing to, to master, which is a highly efficient way to split up your MR. Um, but it does take a bit of creativity and a different perspective sometimes on how you're um, framing it. And it is sometimes tough to keep it all reviewable. So it's not clearly, this is just a, a desired outcome, but it, it's there's situations that it might not be appropriate. But um, I'd love to hear your all thoughts on seeing MRs that were split too finely and the kind of feedback and if you gave feedback and, and how do you handle those? Um, just sorry, uh, Go ahead. Not, nothing really to add for myself. What I'm just looking for is if I recall correctly, it's actually in one of our iteration sub values to split those things in a vertical way rather than horizontal. I'm looking for it and let you go ahead or I come back to this. No, it's just basically was going to validate what Paul said. If I don't see this as a front end maintainer, if I don't see how this is implemented on a real page. It's not a feature. I'm sorry, this is not a minimal viable change. If you just added a component that is no, used nowhere, at least put it somewhere on the page so I could test it properly without doing it myself on checking out the branch. I'm like, okay, where do I put this component to test it? So yeah, and I've seen this in Mars. And I have no idea why people do this. Maybe in the past it was for MR rate. For now it's like, it's very hard to review. It's very hard to follow, especially if you're not a single reviewer or maintainer. It's just like, it's a fifth MR in a row and you have no idea what's going on here. I mean, probably everyone has seen this like chain of MRs when it's not five, but like 10. And you're on the seventh. What I have not that? gotten anything yeah. like that. That would be really confusing. <laughs> I'm... I had it multiple times as a maintainer. It's really, really confusing. I'm trying to think what yeah, the back end like equivalent should be. Um, I really don't know if you could get a back end split up into like 10. I, I, unless you have like multiple database MRs that you split up and then add a model and then add this and then add, the, you know, and maybe like add a service right, and then right. add. Uh, Do you ever see MRs like that? No. <laughs> okay. There you go. No. Uh, <laughs> I had one where like there was a database change made where uh, like an index was being added, but then I couldn't see it used. Like I couldn't see what they were changing. Maybe it was like a scope being yeah. added and like an index being added to support some scope. And then I did have, there was one MR where they were like, oh, this is how it's going to be used. But it's when you're reviewing the database MR, you need to look at like the performance of what's being done. And so that's the only thing I, I've seen that was somewhat similar because if you don't see how it's going to be used, then yeah, it's definitely like a balance because I don't want a large MR, but also um, it's hard to give the correct feedback on it when there's no way to test it. But I guess- And the database ones make me nervous. <laughs> they make me nervous. I. Uh, no, right. sorry. I was going to say that I, I received nonverbal communication from you, Terry. Every time database comes up, like you're, <laughs> you're like scratching your arms or you're like feeling sweaty. I'm joking. I'm sorry, Terry. I don't mean to. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's, it's right up there with the CSS, man. It's right up there. With CSS. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, I have a question for you, Yannick, but first I want to hear what Kasha, what, what were you going to say? Uh, I was just going to say something about the, the backend side of things. So um, I can see someone working towards like a class or a filter or something like that, uh, that they, they're not sure, like it's not fully baked, but it's kind of half baked and they just want to build on top of that. 
and and so you can merge it it's also controversial because it's not used and so like uh someone might say oh because it's not used like you can't merge it but because some pieces of work are so large that you kind of you can't apply like have it built and then apply it because then we will have to put it under a feature flag etc cetera, etc cetera. so I think there are cases when we do decide to merge something that is not used but then like next steps might come must come straight after and it can't be like oh no I'm, I'm gonna pick this up like in, in two milestones that would probably not work Oh, a hundred percent, especially since we have, uh, you know, in total thousands of contributors and hundreds of commits a day, uh, this, this, we can't ever treat like, this is my code and I'm going to work on it later. It's like, no, once it's merged, it's out there. And, um, many times we've received community contributions on code that were slated to be deleted. Uh, and there was no obvious sign that oh, this code is someone else is working on removing all this. And so things like that is something to be aware of. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, question I have for you, Yannick. I think you hopped on the um, the interview training and I was going to ask, do our interview engineers, are they trained on like picking up nonverbal signals like interrogators to know if someone is like, if someone's lying or I don't know, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> that'll probably be not great um because yeah, not, not so much there's there's like a prototype where we monitor their heart rate during the interview but that's about it um, just i see <laughs> something tells I, me honestly what were you say, i don't even look at the person oh when i'm interviewing i honestly am not even looking at the person that's probably i don't know thing. uh yeah i i will it's just like you're supposed to be Really kind of like taking notes I, I find it like a lot it's a lot of like uh, almost like context switching where you're trying to like take notes digest what they're saying help them through the process not freak them out too much you know I I, I don't know I, I feel like I, I've noticed a lot of people seem nervous in interviews but yeah I don't like them so you don't like I, the people I, you're I interviewing or you don't like interviews I don't like being in an interview on either side uh, uh, oh, but okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I feel like both sides are pretty stressful. Um, but yeah, it's interesting where you see if someone uh, is like really, but like when they're nervous, it's like it's an interview and it's scary. I know. I'm, I'm such trying? a bad, I'm really bad at interviewing because I like really want to believe in everybody and I want to make everyone feel better. And I, I'm the worst because I'm, I'm such a, you know, like, I've done like software education I've done and like that's where I'm at so it's hard for me to put that aside and to just I'm evaluating you now is that's really difficult for me to do um cool yeah uh well lots of good conversation we have a few more minutes to hop on reviewing um an MR if someone has an MR that they would uh think would be interesting to uh to uh, offer upon the mob. Uh, I have some MRs on my talk dot on my plate. Natalia knows I have one MR. Right yes, now. don't don't bring my MR. <laughs> <laughs> felt so bad. I um didn't get to get to it, and I felt I, I went to sleep feeling bad. I'm I'm really sorry. But then I woke up this morning. I was like, Natalia's nice. She's not gonna yell at me. So. I mean, that's the MR we already had on the front end pairing once, right? It's the same thing. It's front end caching, very problematic area that we have. Yeah, that's and a. Just to say, I'm not happy with this MR either, okay? <laughs> I don't like the concept. I don't like working on this concept. I don't like the fact that we, that we will merge it in the code base. So that's why I'm like, I, sometimes when, when you speak about it and front end pairing on maybe on this session, like you feel the need to defend the MR because it's your work, but I don't want to, because I don't want front end caching to be in our code base. That's funny. I do, um, one of the comments I hadn't yet written but was in my head was like, 
we need to establish a guideline in the front end and like a link to it of when do we do this and when do we not? And let's lean towards always not like all of that would be great to put in our front end guidelines. Um, that's a really interesting MR. Um, and I really appreciate like, that's a great example of you pinged me really early of just like, Hey, here's the draft. It works. And I'm leaving comments, which you were expecting because it's, here's and i know like hey here's just the draft of it so um that that was a cool mr that was not the mr i was going to bring up uh but we could and maybe just get it done with um yeah i uh i know i have some um i think smaller like front end mrs um there's one i was in the middle of uh had some interesting ux questions which i kind of resolved and internally by just asking a question um so we can hop onto that one uh it probably wouldn't take that long um let's go ahead and do that then uh let me find my my zoom controls uh does anybody wow. notice how do you do that out of... oh what were we gonna say out of curiosity natalia the front end caching mr how large is the diff because i imagine it to be massive i I think it's around 600 lines if I'm not sure. Oh, okay. I imagine much worse. Okay, sweet. Gotcha. And it's only like two mod. There's only like two modules that are the heavy lifters. Everything okay. else is kind of like decorating. It's like I was impressed with the effectiveness with how small of a footprint it was. Like I was I was I was impressed with that. Um uh all right i i noticed um we have uh a, a new i had not interacted with this front ender before but um she has a lovely name uh i don't mean that in a weird way but her name is paulina uh <laughs> all of my friends in high school would would call me paulina because they were not nice uh <laughs> um so this is one I was reviewing locally, and the scope is this. Uh, we um, previously on these uh, timeline events, we uh, did not have this event tag. So we have the ability to tag events. Um, and currently, I don't have my GDK running. I'm not going to try to run it right now because that'll probably go south, the fact that we're on a club. Um, currently, we only have two tags, and you can apply multiple of these tags. But we have start time and end time. So that that sits as a little strange, but the author does um, comment that uh, these are the only tags and that they're contradictory, but the data model is that we're going to have multiple of these tags. So moving forward to something like that, from the user perspective, I was really wrestling with this because I was like, oh, but that's so weird that I can select this is both the start time and end time, but uh, this MR was also UX approved. So at this point, I'm kind of like, okay, I guess I had to pick my battles to some extent of what I think is uh, weird and not weird. Um, so it sounds like this was some sort of UX and product decision that we're okay having start time and end time be our only tags we can select. But other than that, um, the other comment I left was this. Uh, let me go to the. Oh no, I have my review comments here. Um, yes, one thing that stuck out to me as strange was. We're only showing this if we're not editing. So we only show it when we are creating a new event, but the edit form hides this. And as a user, I'd like, I would imagine being super confused if I was trying out this new input, created it, and then wasn't able to change it. I can see that being a confusing situation. Um, she highlighted that, but I went back to the original issue and saw, no, the goal is that we're showing this in both the create and the edit. So that, um, it's sticking out to me as a little strange. So I just ask a question. And usually I find myself timing myself. And if I can't find the answer to something within a time, I need to start thinking about how do I frame a question here. Uh, the other comment I left was um, 
Yeah, this is an interesting one too. From the front end perspective, when you click on these tags, since I don't have the GDK running, I can't show you, but when we click on these tags, um, it'll populate uh, the box, the text box with the description with default based on the tags you clicked. But because we have this condition of, hey, if we're empty, then populate it based on our tags being changed. That means after I've done the first one, it'll never will update again. Uh, and so the normal pattern I see that we do for this is like rather than just testing for emptiness, we test for dirtiness. We have to kind of insert a new state of like, has the user ever touched this? Once the user touches it, we don't ever try to update it again. But if users never touched it, then we'll uh, then we'll um, uh, be free to update this. Uh, and so this is a pattern we do a number of times. I've seen in, in a number of reviews. So uh, I was able to kind of um, touch on that. The interesting thing to take away here is this MR is UX approved, but and this is clearly a UXC issue. But if there's a low hanging fruit that this might be an oversight from UX, we all kind of need to own the end user experience, especially as reviewers and maintainers by asking questions and making suggestions like this. Uh, so I can see how one person would just take away, well, no, I guess it's just how it's supposed to be because it was UX approved. Um, but we don't really get the benefit of having multiple eyes on it if we're not willing to all contribute to the discussion. So uh, that's why uh, I jump in here on things like this. Um, great. So my other main task was just doing a, a once over on this component again and then looking at the tests. And then that was going to be that was going to be it. Um, so let me I had the changes checked out here. Uh, this is me making that patch. So let me just revert what I was doing here. Uh, so for this, oh my gosh. All right, y'all y'all faces take up a lot of screen space. Uh, <laughs> all right, so as I look at this component, we are adding a previous tags, which we initialize here in the data. I am sensing, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Natalia, uh, we'll need to like copy this array if we ever, if we actually use previous tags. Can you put props directly? It would, in, that'll be yeah, it, would, it would be much better to do at least a shallow clone here instead of just doing that. We can, of course, we can do this assignment, but I'm just doing a shallow clone at least shallow clone, just for the sake of not referencing the prop. Yeah. Uh, this um, somewhat exposes the prop to internal, uh, to as internal state, which can be mutated. And since we can't mutate props, um, we should consider shallow cloning this, uh, like so, right? That's JavaScript, right? I do JavaScript. Yeah. Okay. Huh? Um, cool. Uh, and I guess that's the only place previous tags is used. Yep. Where is this tags? Just tags used. Let me see if I can come up with a fancy regex for me to find this. Oh, it's used here as our items that we would select. Okay. Um, there was a comment on the MR relating to this as well, where currently we just have these two hard coded, but it looks like they're coming from other places eventually. Uh, so that's fine. Um, This is our condition for, all right, so let me keep going down. So that looks fine. Our condition for re dropping down text, which is used in 
he dropped down. If we've only selected one, then we just use that value. Otherwise, we're printing out how many tags we have. Uh, well, what if we're not selecting any? Oh, but then we go here to then figure out if we're not selecting any. Um, yeah, this is a minor thing. Uh, I would probably do it this way. I don't know. What do you? What, I'm not trying to be nitpicky, but I'm just. These are just small suggestions. This is a non-blocking suggestion. I don't super. Yeah. Because then I can just. Can I just really quickly circle back to the suggestion you just left? Like shallow clone would be the exact same thing as shallow copy, correct? It's basically creating a new object with the exact same. Image. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Okay, cool. I. Then, then I, I have a suspicion that view might be doing it somewhere on the background, but it's better just to be safe than sorry. So whenever I have okay. object or array and I put it from props to data, I do just a shallow copy. That's right. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting point about the receiving complex objects as props, the need to do that. Um, man, that's tough. Uh, and yeah, and assigning them to data is another problem because mo most likely you will need a watcher on previous tags to make sure that do you need to update the current tags if previous tags are reactive or not? But that's a different story. Sorry. For... I don't know. Would you would you would you classify this suggestion that I'm making here as a non-blocking suggestion or just a minor suggestion? Nitpick. This is a nitpick. Oh man! All right, this has got even promoted to nitpick. All right. Um. Uh. Ending this with a ternary might be a confusing or might be less readable than an early return. What do you think of this? Man. Uh, 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 what I'm laughing about is um, I totally get, I, I get it and um, like, let's put opinionated uh, nitpicks in DSMR. I'm laughing because like just this morning I got a similar nitpick, but it was exactly the other way around. Like I returned early and had the uh, value asking me to return ternary. So always something going on. Not to return early and to use a ternary? Yes. Oh, wow. Well, this is my MR. So we're going to do it my, I'm just <laughs> Uh, okay, cool. Yeah, and then this these all props make sense. So then it was just looking at the tests, and um, I showed you my cool coverage thing I'm playing with. So I'm gonna see if that helps at all. Um, I'm, I really wanted to get the table spit it out, but thanks for helping me uh get that one to where I'm, I'm about to submit it now. So appreciate everybody's hopping on and hanging out. You all have a great rest of the day, and I'll see you later. Bye.